Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another class in our case for the Bible. This is the Bible Fast Forward, and we're in session five this week with our uh, notes. And also, I would reference you to the website if you'd like to get the notes there. It's truthfaithandreason.com, and you can go there to pick up the notes, or maybe you're watching this from that website and the notes are down below. Um, so either way, if you if you like some of the notes, um, some of the things that I'll be talking about um, are not in the slides. So and I so I try to put a lot of my own personal notes on the website if you want to get some of those as well to follow along. And so before we get started tonight, I'm going to open us in prayer. So if you join me, and then we'll get right to the class. Father, thank you for this time in, in which we can just stop our busy day and our busy life and and just spend some time with you and your word. And if we're in a, a little group, we're just so thankful for the group that we're with. If we're doing this um, on our own, then we're so thankful for the opportunity and time to be able to just sit down, open up the Bible, and go through your word and learn for ourselves what it really teaches. Thank you for giving us that. Thank you for giving us the word, the opportunity, and then the desire to do that. Please protect us um, when those distractions come up or the discouragement sometimes with finding time or understanding things. Please give us um, that protection because we know that that's from the evil one and that if we persevere, we're going we're gonna to succeed. We're going to succeed in growing closer to you, Lord God. We're going to succeed in learning um, about your word and about your plan and promise and that overarching pi picture, not only of, not only of the Bible, but human history, you know? So I think it's uh, so important for each and every one of us to spend our own time looking at what the word teaches. And so we pray that you bless our time tonight. We thank you, Jesus, for being the one who fulfilled all that was promised and pictured in the Old Testament that you came and you accomplished and you achieved and you conquered death and Satan by resurrecting from that grave. And that means that we have an eternal home with you because you provided that for us. So we thank you. We pray the Holy Spirit to be the teacher and the guide into all truth as we study. And we pray all things. It's in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right. I'm going to share my screen. Give me just a second. And again, I like to have uh, PowerPoint up so we stay kind of focused on track because I would probably get off track very easily with some of these topics that we're covering. And so this week, we're going to take a look at specifically Genesis 37 to 50, which will end the um, outline that we're doing, the um, depending on how deep you're going, the outline or the note taking reading that you're doing of Genesis. Genesis ends at chapter 50. And so we'll take a look at that tonight. But before we get started, we want to make sure you stop and take a few minutes to do prayer, especially, well, not especially, no matter what, no matter whether you're on your own or if you're doing this in a, in, with someone else or a small group, that kind of thing. Take a little time and pray, share prayer requests with each other, um, and then pray during the week for that person or persons, because the power of prayer is, is something we don't really understand, but it's something God asks us to do. And it's just amazing to see how he answers prayer. And so it's important. It's an important thing, especially in praying for each other. And then one of the things that we're going to do in class, and this is from Greg Kokel's um, Bible Fast Forward. We're watching the DVD in class. I'm not showing it here online unless you got it on your own and maybe you're watching it um, on your own and you can do that I've mentioned before that his the Bible DVD uh, the Bible fast forward is the title and I have it on DVD which we're using which I know that's getting to be old school now but don't think they're streaming it so you probably will have to get the DVD if you want to view it and you can do that at it's str.org str.org, which is standtoreason.org. It's Greg Kokel's website. And one of the major things that he's doing each week on his presentations is he's going over these 12 major historical events of the nation of Israel. And so those of you that 
don't have access to the video, I'm going to just read those off this first time. You might want to jot them down. So if you have your notes, some note pens, a pen and paper or something like that, um, jot these down and it goes in this order. And this kind of helps keep in our own minds um, the historical order of things as it goes through. Because if you're like me at all, when I first started studying the Bible, I didn't have I didn't have a clue where like Moses fit in. Was he before Abraham? Where was Noah? Um, I knew Adam was first, you know, so and what what happened in what order? So I think it's important to to have that as a framework as you study because our focus in this class is a big picture of the Bible. And so I'm going to read those 12 major historical events for the first time this week. Um, and then I'll put it, I'll put it on the website notes. Um, so it should be there as well for those of you that aren't, like I said, in the um, in-person class. So here we go. Um, the first one, the call of Abraham. The second one, the birth of Isaac. Number three, Joseph in Egypt. Number four, the Exodus. Number five, Moses gets the law. Number six, Joshua conquers the land. Number seven, the three kings of the United Kingdom of Israel. And that would be Saul, David, and Solomon. And then the next one, the kingdom splits. Israel in like 10 of them, 10 of the tribes of Israel, there's 12 tribes, 10 of them to the north, two of them in the south. So Israel to the north and Judah is the tribe name for the kingdom of the south. Then there's the Assyrian dispersion of Israel. The northern group is dispersed into Assyrian captivity. And then number 10, the Babylonian captivity of the south. The nation of Judah is taken into captivity in Babylon. Now they will get to return to the land. That's number 11, the return to the land. And then number 12, the coming of Messiah. Now Greg has us do these little hand symbols. I didn't do them right now. And maybe, maybe we'll practice them another time. But if you, if you watch his presentation, you'll see the, the symbols. But this is to set up the history of the nation of Israel. So that's from Abraham, basically, to Jesus is what we're looking at when we kind of memorize these in order. And so within those, there are books in the Bible that address those events and the things that surround those particular events. So hopefully you got those written down. Um, work on memorizing them, because I think it'll help you as you study through the Bible with us. And then number two, recite the memory verse. And this is... Um, the one I had last week, I believe I had it up there. So this will be the second week. I'm trying to do two weeks um, on each of them. And so this is the, the great commandment, known as the great commandment. And it is in Matthew. This is Jesus speaking because he was asked, um, what is the greatest commandment? And he says, to, he says, as an answer, he says to the guy that asks, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. So Jesus is saying you can wrap up the whole law of Moses, which is probably through the at least the see, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, so at least four of those books. Um, that focus on the law, Jesus wraps it all up in this one statement. He also says later on that he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And so meaning that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, the law, all of the prophets, the things that were written, pictured and foreshadowed, Jesus fulfills them in his life and ministry, his death and resurrection. And so <clears throat> I think that's an important commandment. Now, this is actually Jesus, too, reflecting on Deuteronomy chapter 6, if you want to cross-reference that back in the Old Testament um, with the Shema, which is uh, basically the same thing that is said here that Jews will still recite today as part of their, um, their worship time. 
All right. So if you want to hit pause and, and reflect a little bit here and, and do your prayer cards, do that. And then I'm going to get started with our presentation. All right. So at this point in our in-person class, we'd be watching Greg Kokel's presentation, session five. So, um, and he, that would be something we would reflect on just a little bit in class. But then our second half of class, we were going to look at um, the Bible study piece. And from last couple of weeks, what we've done is we've looked at um, a chapter by chapter subject outline. I called it level three. Um, and that's basically reviewing um, the, the titles of the chapters. And I did this one a couple of weeks ago. And so I just want to throw it up there so you can see. And I do want to make a couple comments that I've had a few questions on. First of all, every study Bible is a little bit different in terms of what titles they use at their chapters. And in addition to that, something I've done is taken a little liberty with the titles and, and kind of put it in my own words because reading the chapter, then I know what it's about. I can create my own titles there. And so you you can do that as well. And depending on the type of study Bible you have, sometimes they have subtitles within a chapter. There may be different titles that are listed there depending on the subject that's being talked about in that particular chapter. So when you do this, I'm not going to say there's there's not a, a exact right way to do it. You don't have to have them exactly like I have them. I'm modeling what I'm hoping you're all doing on your own. And that is as you go through, you're writing down titles. And then if you want to go to level four, which is taking notes as you read, and that can get kind of out of hand and crazy if you're if you're a perfectionist, like I don't know, like a lot of people are. And I, I don't know that I'm a perfectionist, but I don't want to miss anything. So it's really important if you're to if you're doing this to try to really work on a summarization skill. And just in a very short summary, you know, it might be just a couple sentences that you're saying what that chapter is about in your own words. That would be the level four, kind of where you'd want to get to and be able to say, oh yeah, chapter three, the fall of man. This is where you know, Adam and Eve, Eve's tempted, you know, by the serpent, you know, and she, she, you know, is tempted and follows through on it. And then Adam, you know, he, he goes along with it. And then God, you know, he gives the most important promise in the Bible. I'm going to say arguably, but my opinion um, is, you know, Genesis 315, where God promises that rescue plan where he promises that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. And he's talking about Jesus. And so that unfolds throughout the rest of Genesis for sure, if not the whole entire Bible. So anyway, just to give you an idea of what we're doing. Also last week, um, or actually, so this one was probably two weeks ago. That one was three weeks ago. So then the period of the patriarch. So we went through, this is really Abraham's story. So from chapters 12 to 23, we're really learning about who Abraham was and how God made a promise to him that is really a, a, a broader unfolding of that Genesis 3.15 promise. It's more specific in how he's going to fulfill that or enact that through the line of Abraham. And so we learn a lot here about Abraham, Abraham not being a perfect person none of us are by any means but he did find favor in god's eyes god was able to use him speak with him develop a relationship with him and abraham is known today as the father of he's the father of the three major religions in the world today you know he's considered the father of, of judaism the father of christianity and the father of islam now i would argue that christianity the Bible is going to give you the big picture, going to give you the best answer and the best solution to the problems that we see in life and the big questions that we have in life today. And so the Christian worldview, I will argue to the death, is the correct worldview. And the Christian worldview is really an extension of the Jewish worldview. We've got the other half of the story. 
they're still waiting for it. Islam, in my opinion, has perverted or twist that story. In fact, Islam doesn't even come into existence until about 600 years after the time of Jesus. So um, just to throw that out there, but you can kind of see the history, particularly when you study um, moving forward a little bit more about, and we did this last week, Isaac and his story. And as his life develops and he is that promised son, he is the one, he is the seed promise. He is the one that God told Abraham would carry that blessing forward, that promise forward, that covenant promise. And then we also got into the story of Jacob. And Jacob is the guy who God changes his name to Israel. This is where Israel comes from, the nation. And Jacob has 12 sons. And we see that in chapter 35, the 12 sons of Israel and the beginning of that particular nation. So this is the start of the nation of Israel. And so what we're going to do tonight is to take a look at Joseph. And we're going to look at Joseph's story. Now, Joseph is one of the 12 sons. He is the favored son of Jacob's Israel. And this is where we have a transition into what I'm going to say is uh, gives us a really interesting picture of the person of Jesus, which we see over and over again throughout the Old Testament. We see these foreshadowings or pictures of who Jesus would be and what his life and ministry and purpose was to be all about. And we get these over and over again. We saw that last week when we talked about um, Isaac or actually two weeks ago, when we talked about Isaac and when Abraham took him up to the mountain to, to sacrifice his one and only son, you know, that whole thing pictured Jesus. And so again and again, individuals, events, stories are here as narratives. Not They're not stories. I like the word narrative better because it's history. It's true history. And what's really cool about the Bible is that we can confirm so much of this history, so many of these narratives using outside sources, using other uh, cultural histories that confirm what's being taught here, using archaeology that uncovers things that are being taught in the Bible, confirming that they're true. And so these are not just stories, but these are narratives, and it makes sense because God inspired the Bible. He inspired these words. He inspired these writers with truth, and we'll see that. And particularly, this is Moses, as we go back to who was the author. This is Moses writing. And so um, Joseph's story, we see in chapter 37. So I'm going to run through these with you and kind of see how you did, if you did these for homework, I hope. And so chapter 37, this is a transitional chapter. This uh, chapter is one that we see a transition to this person of Joseph, Joseph from the story of Jacob and his name change to Israel. And we see this in the story of Joseph, who is the second to the youngest son of Jacob. So he's 11th in line. And I'm going to say Jacob slash Israel. There's times that we'll, we'll read where Jacob's name is used and times that we'll read where they call him Israel. And so um, kind of reference, you know, Jacob Israel, so you'll know who we're talking about. And so Joseph is his favorite, his favorite son, because he is the son of Jacob's beloved wife, Rachel, who died giving birth to Benjamin, who is the youngest son, the 12th son. Now, Joseph's brothers are jealous of him because Jacob shows favoritism towards him and even allows Joseph to have some a role of kind of leadership over his older brothers because he sends them out to go check on his brothers. And they would probably, you know, consider that, you know, snitching, you know, is he here comes the snitch, here comes the, the little um, favored brat kind of thing. And Joseph doesn't make it any better because in his youthful zeal, he shares his dreams and he has dreams of ruling over his brothers 
and them bowing down to him, which actually does come true later on in the story we're going to see. So in this chapter, we see the culmination of this jealousy as the brothers sell Joseph into slavery instead of killing him like some of them wanted to do. Now, if you notice, if you're reading this, you're going to notice that Reuben, the oldest, wasn't there when it happened. So it would have been Simeon, second oldest, who was in charge. Kind of keep that in mind going forward because we'll, we'll bring that up again in a few chapters here. The brothers dipped the cherished robe of Joseph in animal's blood and deceived their father into thinking it was Joseph's blood and that he had been killed by a wild animal. I don't know how you do this to your father because obviously he was just devastated and distraught and just it just almost killed him. But the cruelty of his brothers are going to come back on them later on as we're going to see. Now what's interesting here is that chapter 38 we get the story of Judah and Tamar the birth of Perez. And so this chapter is kind of a side story. I'm going to say it's another R-rated chapter, like we had the one earlier with Dinah, and there's been a few of those. And it's seemingly out of place because it is a story of Judah. But inside secret, if we haven't talked about it before, Judah is the seed carrier. I would think it'd be Joseph, but it isn't. It's Judah. He is the seed carrier. He is going to be the line that Jesus comes from. So I think there's some importance to why this, this chapter is here. Now, Judah, he in this chapter, he moves away from his family and he starts his own family with a Canaanite woman. Again, this is part of the reason we're going to see God needing to move these people of Israel to Egypt and kind of get them out of this pagan culture that they're living in. And he's going to separate them into their own land in Goshen in Egypt. Otherwise, they would have started to syncretize, you know, kind of mix in with these pagan cultures. And so this story is a culturally based story in that Tamar, who, you know, is, is the daughter-in-law of Judah, she knows she should be taken care of by Judah after two of her husbands die. So that's an important point um, because Judah, he doesn't follow through with taking care of her. He should give her his third son, but he was afraid he would die. Therefore, Tamar devises a plan to sleep with Judah himself after his wife dies. So obviously a few years go by here. And she conceives by Judah twins, and one of them, Perez, will be the one that continues on that seed line to Jesus. So this is just a really weird story, kind of side story, but we see how God intervenes in so many ways, so many times to keep his promise going. And so that's, if you haven't read these, please read them. They're very, very good reading. They're definitely not boring by any means. All right, in chapter 39, we get Joseph is thrown into prison in Egypt because of Potiphar's wife. So we return here to the main narrative and we find Joseph, who's been sold into slavery, now under the ownership of Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh. And we are told that Joseph found favor with Potiphar and he put him in charge of his whole house and they prospered. And we're going to notice how we see God's hand of protection on Joseph throughout his whole life story. But now for a second time, even though he's innocent... Keep that in mind as Joseph pictures Jesus in many ways here. Even though he's innocent, um, Joseph is mistreated and he's accused of rape by Potiphar's wife. And I would note that many scholars believe that Potiphar knew Joseph was innocent and that's why he had him thrown in jail instead of killing him because he could have killed him. Um, but I think he just kind of, you, you got to go, you know, he's got to have known how his wife was and what's going on here and how how actually trustworthy Joseph was. So Joseph's now thrown into jail. Now in chapter 40, while in jail, Joseph, again, finding favor with the head jailer, is put in charge of the other inmates and affairs of the jail. And during this time, God gives him the ability to interpret dreams. One for the cupbearer, which turned out favorably, and the other for the baker, which turned out to be his demise. 
And again, uh, scholars here believe that it was most likely, there had most likely been an attempt on Farrell's life and the baker was found responsible. Both would have access to the food and drink Farrell had. So there probably had been some kind of an assassination attempt. So the cupbearer was restored to his duties for Farrell, but he forgot all about Joseph. And moving on in this chapter, we get uh, two whole years later, the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh has some disturbing dreams and none of his wise men can, wise men can interpret them. But now the cupbearer suddenly remembers Joseph and tells the Pharaoh about his ability to interpret dreams. So the Pharaoh sends for Joseph and after they clean him up, and this is kind of an important side, but Egyptians were all about cleanliness and clean shaving. And so any kind of, you know, disgusting, dirty person who'd been in jail or a uh, like a sheep, you know, a shep herder like Joseph came from, that kind of thing were considered disgusting. And we'll see that later on. And so um, as it moves on, they send for Joseph and he appears before the Pharaoh and he interprets his dreams, telling him they were about seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. And he also lays out a plan to avoid disaster for Egypt by storing up grain and food for the first seven years to last during the second seven years of drought. Again, note, Joseph always gives God the credit and glory for what he does. He does not take it for himself. He even tells the Pharaoh, this is from God. This is not mine. And so Pharaoh was so impressed with Joseph that he puts him in charge of the kingdom as second only to Pharaoh himself. During this time, Joseph marries an Egyptian woman and has two sons whose names will be prominent in their tribes, you know, in the tribe of Israel or in their own individual tribes of the nation of Israel later on. And these might sound familiar, but it's Manasseh and Ephraim. So they're going to be, you don't hear so much about Joseph, the tribe of Joseph later on. You hear about the tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim. So it's kind of it, what's going to happen is Joseph is getting that double portion blessing from his father and these two become tribes. All right. In chapter 42, we find the famine hitting hard in Canaan, where Israel, Joseph, Jacob, Israel and his family live. And he, Jacob, he sends his sons, but not Benjamin, down to Egypt to buy grain. And when they get to, to Egypt, what happens? They end up bowing down before Joseph, just like his dreams predicted, and they don't recognize him, but he recognizes them. And Joseph decides to test them, and he treats them roughly and accuses them of being spies. They end up telling him about their family and their father and brother that did not come. And Joseph tells them to not come back unless they bring that brother. And he keeps Simeon with him in jail. Note, Note, many scholars believe Joseph kept Simeon. Remember I said earlier about Simeon, kept Simeon because he was the one in charge back when they had wanted to kill Joseph. And, but Judah is the one that suggested to sell him to the Midianite slave traders. So just kind of food for thought. It's a little speculation, but kind of makes sense. It is also interesting to note that Joseph understood and heard what they were saying. And when they were talking about their sins against Joseph in the past, and that this was their reckoning for that crime. But we also see Joseph secretly taking care of them by returning their money, which they found in their sacks, but they think it's part of the penalty from God. And Jacob at this point would not let them go back with, Jim, with Benjamin. So there's kind of a stalemate here. They know Simeon's been held there. Joseph kept him in jail. Um, but Jacob doesn't want to let them go back and take Benjamin, but they're supposed to. And so this is going to be a problem. And in chapter 42, which is where we are, we find Israel, that family, has run out of food and Jacob had has to send them back to Egypt. But here we begin to see a change in character for Judah. This is interesting. As he steps up in this chapter to assure his dad, that he would be personally responsible for the care of Benjamin and will later offer up his own life for Benjamin's. We'll see that in the reading. When they get back to Egypt, Joseph brings them into his home and he feeds them. 
and he sits them in the order of their birth, which amazed them. It kind of blew their minds. How would he know? You know, they were all older. So how would he know who was oldest and in, in, no, in the right order? Now, another note here, just notice that Joseph had to leave the room when he sees Benjamin, his full brother, because of the emotion he had. And then, kind of funny, he makes sure Benjamin gets five times the amount of food that the others got. And they're all astonished. They just, they just can't understand what's going on here. And then, and so that was in chapter 43. And then in chapter 44, um, let's make sure I'm on my right notes here. Everything comes to a head in this chapter. And Joseph um, sends them off with grain and all his stuff. And every, and now though, he puts in his personal cup in Benjamin's sack. When Joseph sent his steward after them, he, of course, found the cup and arrested them. It is here that we see a complete change in Judah when he recounts to Joseph all of their family history and then states that he will take Benjamin's place. He makes a sacrificial substitute of himself so that the rest of the family could return home and their father would be okay. And so now in chapter 45, Joseph um, could take it no more after seeing their repentant hearts, especially Judah, who was the one in chapter 37 that suggested they sell him into slavery. And he sent all his servants out and revealed himself to his brothers. The brothers are in shock and fearful, but Joseph assures them. And he says this, um, he says this in verses seven and eight, he says, God sent me before you to preserve life. And he goes on to say, now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his household and ruler over all of the land of Egypt. So he's telling them it's, it wasn't you guys. It was God that made this possible because Joseph was so favored by the Pharaoh Pharaoh gave him wagons and provisions and brought Joseph's whole family from Canaan to Egypt to be carried for to be cared for during this time of famine. And of course, Joseph's father, Jacob, is so unbelievably shocked when they tell him Joseph is alive. He almost faints. Probably could have died right there on the spot. But then he says, let's go. And notice this is how. Israel ends up in Egypt. The nation of Israel that's just barely getting started ends up in Egypt. And this is how God is protecting them. And he will protect them for the next 400 years. In chapter 46, um, we find Jacob setting out with his family. And we get a genealogy of this nation in verses 8 through 27. So as they set out towards Egypt, Jacob, Israel, stops in Beersheba and offers sacrifices to God. And God again speaks to him, confirming the Abrahamic promise and protection in Egypt. And in verses three and four, this is what he says. He said, I am God, the God, and that's Yahweh. I am, I am God, Yahweh, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also surely bring you up again. And Joseph will close your eyes. Notice the promise to return to the land. And this will happen in the book of Exodus. At the end of this chapter, we get a long-awaited reconnection of Joseph with his father, Jacob. Jo Joseph tells his family that they must say they are shepherds to the Pharaoh. And this will allow them to live in the land of Goshen, separate from the Egyptians. Because remember I mentioned before, shepherds are like disgusting. They're loathsome to the Egyptians. We see that in verse 34. All right, chapter 47, we see Jacob arriving in Egypt and he meets with the Pharaoh. And the Pharaoh allows them to settle in Goshen. It's kind of separate, you know, separates them. He puts them in, which is a really good land for farming. He, he allows them to settle in Goshen and they prosper under Joseph and this Pharaoh. We also see the beginning of what appears to be a type of slavery or servanthood. Um, as the people of the land, and this is everybody, because of the severity of the famine, have to sell their land and themselves to the Pharaoh um, because of the severity of that famine. 
At this point, it says in the text, four fifths would be, be for them to still live on and one fifth would go to the Pharaoh, but the Pharaoh was now considered the owner of the land. We are also told in this chapter that Jacob lived in this land 17 years. So he was there quite a long time and that he lived a total of 147 years. Jacob made Joseph promise to take him back to the land of Canaan and bury him there. In these last few chapters, we have the final days of Jacob and his, and his life. And um, this would be starting in chapter 48. And so we see um, him give prophecies to his sons. And he does that instead of the traditional blessing, although he does give Joseph a double blessing or portion, one for each of his children. Um, this will change the way the promise goes forth. Instead of a singular birthright or blessing, it would be now the nation as a whole. Although it will be through Judah that the seed promise will come. In this chapter, we see special time Jacob spends with his beloved son, Joseph, and the blessing he gives them as well. And we see this prophecy, prophecy here in Jacob's blessing to Ephraim, the youngest, over Manasseh, the older one. Again, as God always knows what will happen, he doesn't just have to follow the tradition. He knows what's going to happen. Ephraim's going to be the stronger. Sure. And in 49, this chapter gives us Jacob's final words or prophecies to each of his sons, as they will now take on responsibility as individual tribes of Israel. And we want to pay special attention given to the prophecy, to, given in the prophecy to Judah. And we will find throughout the rest of the history of Israel that it will be the tribe of Judah that will survive the test of time till Messiah comes, Jesus. And so I want to read what he says to Judah here. He says, Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down to you. Judah's a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He couches, he lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Most important right there nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes. That's a reference to Messiah. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. He ties his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washes the garments in wine and his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are dull from wine, his teeth white from milk. Those are some uh, veiled references to what's going to happen to Jesus. And at the end of this chapter, we read about the death of Jacob. Again, he was 147 years old. Now, the final chapter of Genesis, chapter 50, we read about the family of Israel taking Jacob back to Canaan to be buried in the cave of Abraham. Sarah is also there. Isaac and Rebekah, his parents, are also there. And Leah, his, his wife, the one that bore him the majority of the children, Rachel's not there. They had buried her near Ephraim on the road where she died. So it's Rachel that's, I mean, it's Leah that's there. And they go with Pharaoh's blessings and elders of Egypt. Even the Egyptians mourn the death of Jacob, as he must have been a well-respected well respected like Joseph. And the most important passage in this story, and I believe God wants us to understand this, is when Joseph's brothers feared his retaliation like they had earlier, now that their father had died, because they're kind of thinking, you know, my, our father's dead. Now he's really going to retaliate on us. And they came before him and they just, they bowed and said, we are your servants. Behold, we are this, your servants. And in verses 19 through 21, it says, but Joseph said to them, do not be afraid for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. This is, this is important. I think that's, that's a good takeaway application for us to think about when something bad is happening. You know, God is using it for good. And so I would, I would definitely use that. And then the end of the chapter here tells us about Joseph's death. And this is going to be that segue into the book of Exodus. And I want to read this last part here as we finish off verses 22 to 26. It says, now Joseph 
stayed in Egypt, he and his father's household, and Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw the third generation of Ephraim's sons, also the sons of Makar, the sons of Manasseh, were born on Joseph's knee. Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely take care of you and bring you up from this land to the land which he promised an oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones from here. So up from here. So Joseph died at the age of 110, and he was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. Now, that's an important point because we're going to have about 400 years go by, and now we're going to get the story as we begin reading Exodus in just a little while um, and looking at what happened. How did what happened to this nation and what changed during that period of time that took them from being a prosperous nation in Egypt, the, the nation of Israel, to one that's enslaved and basically, um, you know, just tor tortured to some extent um, by the time we get to this next book, the book of Exodus. And so we'll see, you know, this ending here we're going to reference back to when we get to the book of Exodus. All right, so we'll stop at that point and I'll ask, you know, that you share um, if you're studying with someone else, just any shelf questions that you might have at this point or things, you know, you're jotting down questions or things you didn't quite understand or things you'd like to go back to later on, you know, and maybe restudy or reread to learn a little bit more. And so I hope that this big picture of Genesis has helped. We're going to go a little deeper next week. And what I want to do is finish off our format and look at some of those things like the um, going deeper, you know, the covenants. Where, where are the covenants in this book and how do they all kind of connect and point to number six, you know, Jesus. Where is Jesus in this book? What's going on there? Where can we find him and what do we see? We've talked a little bit about it. And then looking at some applications and again, just kind of reviewing our shelf questions number eight. And then that'll finish off that format that we're using for our um, book by book study, our survey of the Bible. And we'll move into Exodus after that and, and we'll kind of keep, keep going on this. Hopefully this is a way that's going to help you because the whole idea is giving you some tools and um, equipping you to be able to study the Bible for yourself. And so again, if you have any questions, comments, things you'd like to share, um, feel free to go to the website and, you know, you can put some things there. You can email me or whatever uh, works best for you. So I uh, pray that you have a blessed week and hope to see you back again next week. All right. Bye-bye.